Today, we'll uncover the chilling truth behind the real-life Hannibal Lecter, the story of Alfredo Simmons, a cold-blooded killer who confessed to brutally murdering three innocent children. We're going to delve deep into the twisted mind of a remorseless criminal and discover the shocking conversation between a doctor and a prison director that inspired one of the most infamous characters in literature and cinema. Brace yourselves for an unparalleled journey into the mind of a monster. This is the true story of the inspiration for Hannibal Lecter. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wemmes, here, one of my writers. Kevin has written me, uh, as you heard from that introduction, all about Alfredo Trevino. If I'm pronouncing that Trevino, I think the little it's got a little hat on the end. Which I mean, yeah, yeah, is that right? Is that Spanish? I don't know. Look, uh, the real story behind the Silence of the Lambs. I've never read this before. This is all brand new to me. So let's just jump in, shall we? Today's story is about a 64-year-old case from Mexico that was almost entirely unknown in America until about 10 years ago. So most of my research today is from Spanish sources. I did my best, but I apologize if I got any of the finer details wrong. That's okay, Kevin. I'm sure the comments on YouTube will correct us because that's what comments on YouTube do. But with that out of the way, let's take a look at Alfredo Bolli Trevino, the real-life killer who inspired the character of Hannibal Lecter and the last person to be sentenced to death in Mexico. Mexico doesn't have death penalty? Wow. That's progressive i guess mexico i feel like you could use the death penalty to be honest like i've heard of juarez wasn't there a few years ago just a bunch of people were hung off a bridge uh, because they like crossed the gangs or uh gangs cartels like mexico maybe you need the death penalty maybe that'll act as a better deterrent than uh, what you currently have because i don't know when i think of mexico one of the first things that comes to mind is crime and tacos it's the perfect combination an auspicious encounter Dykes Askew Simmons was a crane operator from Texas. He normally is referenced as having a rap sheet for petty crime, though there appears to be at least one instance of grand theft auto, so I'm a little skeptical about the definition of petty. There doesn't seem to be any history of violent crime, but Simmons did find himself in Wichita Falls Mental Hospital for his crimes. Honestly, it sounds like he probably found himself in Wichita Falls Mental Hospital because he was mental. Well, like, that's not the right word, but why is a mental hospital? Can a mental hospital, is that politically correct to call it a mental hospital? <laughs> that is, doesn't, isn't mental kind of derogatory? It's like, he's mental, mate. Um, psychiatric institution, maybe? But look, something was wrong with his brain. Simmons didn't care much for being locked up in a mental hospital, so in 1959, he decided to take an unauthorized vacation to Mexico. Unfortunately, not far from where he crossed the border, a lone man attacked three young siblings, Hilda, Martha, and Manuel Perez Villa Gomez. Two of them died instantly, but one of the girls survived for 17 days, long enough to identify Simmons as her attacker. Was he actually guilty of the murders? We can't know for sure. Yes, the dying girl identified him as the killer, but she identified lots of people as the killer, including her doctor. But once the finger was pointed at Simmons, he was convicted and sentenced to death um that's not okay that's all that they based it on she was obviously delusional she said the doctor was a killer and then another guy comes along and is like is this the killer she's like yeah sure okay yeah that and you and you and they're like death that makes no sense this was a major story that caught the attention of the media across the united states and it was a political disaster for both countries simmons was the first american citizen to be condemned to death in mexico on shaky evidence no less the united states government didn't want to appear like it was unable to protect its citizens abroad but the mexican government didn't want to appear as though they were caving to the american government look i have to say that this is a country's prerogative like America can't be like, well, we're not happy with your justice system, so we're going to, like, steal someone. Like, I, I feel like this is a Star Trek thing. But it's like, whenever they go to an alien planet, and one of the crew members beams down to the surface, and they commit some heinous crime that's not really a crime, uh, you know, in the Federation, on the planet, the, the captain's always like, well, I'm sorry, but you committed the crime on the planet. We're not going to beam you up. You're going to have to face the consequences, no matter how ridiculous that seems. Which does seem a bit insane. But it is also other countries, and other planets in my examples, prerogative to have crap just justice systems. And if you go to that country, you're kind of taking that risk. 
A compromise was reached whereby if Simmons petitioned to have his sentence commuted, he would be released and allowed to go back to the United States. But he refused. Doing so would likely have required an admission of guilt, and Simmons remained adamant that he had never killed anyone. Mate, it's in Mexico. Just be like, yeah, sure, I did it. And then go home to America, and everyone's going to be like, I'm glad you're home because uh, you obviously didn't do it. Just don't go to Mexico again. <laughs> Besides, he was still wanted in Texas for escaping from the mental hospital, so any government orchestrated release would likely see him just being moved from one prison to another. Look, I would ru- <laughs> Is there any question about this? Would you A, rather be on death row in Mexican prison or in an American mental hospital? Uh, th- th- it's like, neither of these are desirable, but I'm always going to choose option B. He decided that he would just stay in Topo Chico prison in Monterey and await his execution. Dude, what are you doing? That is extremely... Did you just, you just not care? This was his official plan, at least, but Simmons didn't much care for being locked up in Mexican prison either. Oh, he's planning an escape, isn't he? In 1963, he attempted to escape from Topo Chico, but instead of finding his way back to Texas, all he found was the sudden pain of having his legs pierced by a pair of bullets from the guards. Frankly, I find this escape attempt a little bit rude, even if he was innocent. Thanks to his case being a bit of an international incident, he had already agreed to conduct an interview with a 23-year-old journalist that would be traveling to Mexico to meet him at the prison just a couple of days later. It would have been impolite to stand him up. The reporter was a man named Thomas Harris, who wrote for Argosy, the first and longest-running pulp magazine. If you don't recognize his name and didn't figure it out from the title of this episode... <laughs> Yes, we did. Thomas Harris wrote Silence of the Lambs. Harris was the man who would go on to write Red Dragon and The Silence of the Lambs. I have actually, I think I've read both of those books. I remember them being very good, but I, I read them, I mean, not a kid, but probably a teenager. Wasn't Red Dragon after Silence of the Lambs, or am I just imagining that? Harris was still going to have his opportunity to interview Simmons, but he first requested to speak with Dr. Salazar, the man that had saved Simmons' life. Harris described him as a small, lithe man with dark red hair, saying that there was a certain elegance about him. Yeah, this <laughs> he's a writer, isn't he? You could tell. A small, lithe man with dark red hair. <laughs> While he may have been referring to the doctor's demeanor, this was something that would have been notable immediately upon meeting the man. Despite working at a prison, Dr. Salazar, Salazar dressed extremely well. He wore fine, light-colored suits, probably all custom-made as he was from an upper-class family. He also usually wore dark sunglasses and, of course, his gold Rolex watch. Wearing a Rolex in prison is a baller move and potentially asking for trouble, but when the inmates know that you can control whether they live or die, they'll probably have the sense to leave it well enough alone. Yeah, it's it's a pretty... It's, it's, that's a straight gangster move it's like you don't touch me because you know how much power i have and like that's intense and he's just wearing these nice suits and he's just a small guy and i'm sure there's all these like scary mexican drug lords and he's just like no i control things you're not locked in here with you that's it you're locked in here with me <laughs> scary. However, what struck Harris most was the line of questioning that Dr. Salazar wanted to engage in. He seemed extremely curious about Simmons' psychology. He first asked Harris if he had sunglasses with him, which he did, and then he warned Harris not to wear them when he interviewed Simmons, otherwise he might see his own reflection in them. You see, Simmons had a cleft lip and several scars on his forehead, and Dr. Salazar felt that this deformity and the effect it had on his life may have been the source of Simmons' psychological troubles. Harris would later recall a part of their conversation thusly, Dr. Salazar, but tell me, do you think Simmons was bullied by other kids during recess because he's a man with a physical defect? Harris. Probably, that's common. Yes, it is common. Did you see pictures of the victims, the two young girls and the little brother? Yes. Would you say they were attractive kids? They were good-looking kids from a good family with a good education, I've been told. But you're not saying they provoked him, are you? No, of course not, but childhood afflictions make later afflictions easily recreated. Their conversation about the psychology and motive behind Simmons' actions continued for a few minutes before the prison director knocked on the doctor's office door to let Harris know that his time was up. Harris thanked Dr. Salazar for his time and invited him to join him for a lunch or a drink if he ever traveled to Texas. Wait, have we taken attack? Is this dude actually guilty? I kind of thought that he... I, I just assumed he was innocent because the, the random girl in the hospital was like, this guy killed me, but she said every... I, I just assumed this was... Uh, he was innocent and is improperly imprisoned. But, and he was saying he was innocent, but is he about to confess all of his sick crimes to Harris? What's going on? As they left the office to go interview Simmons, Harris asked the prison director how long Dr. S Dr. Salazar had been working there. The director looked at him and said, Hombre, don't you know who that is? The doctor is a murderer. He'll never leave this place. He's insane. Wh uh, what? Uh, what? What? <laughs> okay. And he's just rolling around in his suits and a Rolex? 
Harris was more than a little confused as he had seen other patients walking to Dr. Salazar's office. Not only did the doctor treat inmates, he also treated people from the local community. When asked, the director simply explained to him that he was a good doctor and that, with poor people, he doesn't act insane. It wouldn't be until almost 50 years later that Harris learned that the man's name was not actually Dr. Salazar. It was the nickname he was given within the prison, one of his many nicknames, alongside the werewolf of Nuevo Leon, the vampire Bali, and the much less creative Killer Doctor. As the 25th anniversary of the 1980s release of the novel Silence of the Lambs approached, Harris decided that he wanted to include a forward to tell the story of the doctor he met in Mexico who inspired him to create Hannibal Lecter. Since he only had a fake name he was given half a century earlier and didn't even know that it was fake, tracking down the real doctor proved to be a little bit difficult. He finally was able to identify him as Alfredo Barley Trevino, but the real doctor had died just years earlier in 2009. Alfredo may have been a physician rather than a psychiatrist, but it was his elegant nature and interest in the psychology of other patients that inspired Harris. Even though their conversation was brief, the eerie nature of this small doctor who stood almost motionless while interrogating him about the minds of other killers made a lasting impression. And yes, I realize that psychiatrists are actually medical doctors slash physicians, but you know what I mean. But before we get to Alfredo's story, perhaps you'd like to know what happened to Simmons. Well, despite being shot during his previous escape attempt, he still didn't care much for being locked up in Mexican prison. He attempted to escape again in 1969, only this time he succeeded. Okay, yeah, I started this story thinking it was about Simmons, but it's uh, it's obviously about the, uh, the killer doctor, or whatever his other more creative nicknames were. There are a couple of different stories for how this happened, one of which involves him dressing up as a nun. The more realistic story is that he bribed a guard to get out of his cell when his brother was visiting and he hid in a custom-built hidden compartment in his brother's car while they drove out of the prison through the guard checkpoints. After ten years sitting on death row, Simmons was finally a free man. Well, apparently that's all it takes to escape from Mexican prison. <laughs> a bribe and a hidden box in a car. <laughs> Once it was discovered that he had escaped back to Texas, Mexican authorities chose to just leave it alone rather than fight the U.S. for extradition. Simmons' escape had neatly cleaned up the political debacle that originally ensued by an American being sentenced to death in Mexico. If we are to believe that he was in fact innocent, it was the best possible outcome for everyone. But if we are to believe that he really did kill those children, then the best possible outcome for everyone would be would come five months later when Simmons' body was found beaten to death in Fort Worth, Texas. Much like his original arrest in Mexico and his escape back to America, this made nationwide news. His death was deemed suspicious, and within days, a burly, blonde ex-convict was charged with his murder. <laughs> I like how they go, this death seems suspicious. Yeah, he was beaten to death. <laughs> well, oh no, it was, it's not suspicious. It's natural causes. He, he, or he beat himself to death with a blunt object. It's hard to know how to feel about Simmons' case. Sure, he had a history of criminal activity, but there's a big difference between stealing a car for money and murdering three children for no discernible reason. We'll never know for certain the full story of what happened involving Simmons, but fortunately the good doctor had the courtesy to remove any moral ambiguity by confessing to his crime. So, in our foreplay, let's get on with the main event, shall we? The murder of Jesus Castillo Rangel. There isn't a lot of information available about the early life of Alfredo, though he doesn't seem to have had the same sort of tragic and abusive upbringing that we expect from our killers. What we do know is that he came from a well-off family, and he and his siblings were pushed by their father to study hard so that they could succeed. But just how sternly their father pushed them is impossible to determine. Nothing indicates that Alfredo is the victim of abuse or domestic violence, but this was also Mexico in the 30s and 40s, where corporal punishment was extremely common. His father is described as being strict and always carrying a gun around, traits that Alfredo would adopt as well. So while there's a good chance that he experienced some more than gentle coaxing and words of encouragement, it's likely nothing would have been considered considered excessive by the societal standards of the day. What's, I find this so interesting that, or, or not interesting, but it's going to be weird. Do you ever think about stuff that you remember that when you're old and you tell young people, they're going to be like, what? Like, my dad would, ha they, like, they had canes. Like, at school, they would cane him. And obviously they didn't when I was a kid. And I'll be like telling my kids this. They'll be like, I'll be like, yeah. And when granddad was a kid, they would whip him at school if he did a bad. <laughs> and as I found this unusual, like as a kid, but now like a generation or two even removed from me, it's going to seem insane that at school teachers got to whip students or like hit them with a ruler. And <laughs> it's like, that's wild. All of this encouragement, in whatever form it came, worked, and Alfredo became a medical doctor, as did two of his brothers. By 1959, at the age of 28, he was already a successful doctor. However, 
He engaged in a certain practice that, while technically decriminalized in Mexico back in 1871, was still seen as unforgivable in the 1950s. Alfredo may not have been a cannibal by do like Dr. Lecter, but he loved swallowing man meat. Oh, oh my, okay. Dude, it's okay to be gay. We understand. Decriminalized in 1871. Good for you, Mexico. At the very least, that's how all the papers of the time reported it, but there remains a lot of uncertainty and conflicting reports when it comes to the motive behind the murder. When did the UK decriminalize homosexuality? I feel like it was like, it could have been 1971, to be honest. Wow, Mexico. On October the 8th, 1959, 20-year-old medical student Jesus Castillo Rangel went to Alfredo's office to see him in between patients. They had allegedly been seeing one another romantically, but Jesus wasn't just dropping by for some afternoon delight. There are three different possible catalysts for what happened next, and there's no way to determine which is the truth since Alfredo refused to ever talk about it. The most widely reported version is that Jesus and Alfredo had been in a relationship, but Jesus came to the office that day to break things off because he was insistent on marrying a woman. It's certainly the most scandalous option, but it's hard to say whether or not it's the most likely. Both of the other explanations involve money. The less sinister of these is that Alfredo had lent Jesus a large sum of money, but Jesus was having difficulty paying it back, which finally erupted into a fight. The alternative was that Jesus came to blackmail Alfredo due to their sexual relationship. Even though publicly revealing this would have also damaged Jesus' reputation as well, it would have been far worse for Alfredo. He was already an established and respected doctor who would have been seen as taking advantage of his position of power over the much younger medical students yeah dude that's not gonna look good for you even in like 1959 <laughs> all three of these scenarios were reported as fact by various news outlets and all seem to be based on hearsay so i guess you can just pick whichever one you think is more believable i don't know media are always gonna i just think it's the money thing i do think the money thing is just probably more likely because media love to blow out of proportion once the argument erupted between the two alfredo used the old rag soaked in ether trick to subdue jesus before injecting him with sodium pentanol to make sure that he wouldn't wake up oh my lord <laughs> well that escalated quickly he then dragged his victim to the officer's bathroom and placed the body in the bathtub he slit Hazus's throat with a scalpel and completely exsanguinated the body before slicing it into pieces. The body was disassembled to the point that it could fit inside a surprisingly small box. That's a quote, by the way. Oh my lord. Alfredo placed the box in his car and went to visit Francisco Villarreal, who occasionally worked for him and was allegedly also his lover. They trans- <laughs> Dude. What's in the box, Doc? Oh, that's just my other lover. Wow, he fits in this- Oh. <laughs> You're not gonna do that to me, are you, Doc? No, definitely not. Oh my god, what, were you, what are you doing? They transferred the box to Francesco's car and then went to visit his aunt, Guadalupe Villarreal, who owned a nearby ranch. Alfredo borrowed a shovel from Guadalupe, and he and Francisco buried what, as far as Francisco knew, was a, bo was a box of unimportant medical waste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's, what's in this box? It's medical waste. Why are we going out to my aunt's ranch and burying it really deep in the middle of nowhere and then you're swearing me to silence about it? What's up with that, Doc? I'm not going to end up in a box as well, Doc, am I? Because I guess burying medical waste on an isolated patch of your aunt's ranch was normal practice back in the 1950s, right? The next morning, a shepherd working for Guadalupe stumbled upon a strange area of stones and disturbed ground after following a cow that wandered off from the group. He, con he contacted the police who found the body. Wow, that's unfortunate. It took a day. <laughs> It didn't take long for Alfredo to be identified as the chief suspect, especially since he didn't have the courtesy to return the shovel. Homicide detectives went to Alfredo's office pretending to be patients. Once they revealed their identities and tried to arrest him, he offered them two cars, his office, and the pharmacy owned by his father. Mexican police have a reputation for being rather amenable to bribes, and that was a pretty nice offer, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> it's also gonna look so suspicious. Like, when you get a bribe, it's like, oh, why do you own a pharmacy now? G cop? Someone, I mean, I guess then you're just like, you, you, you're you also like, do you want half of a pharmacy person investigating this? I mean, just because the corruption just runs so deep. But it's still like, Jesus. Once in custody, Alfredo didn't try to contest the charges against him. Instead, he went the opposite route and bragged about what an amazing job it did. What are you talking about, Alfredo? You did a sh job. You murdered someone. And then they literally found the body the next day. And then came to you the day after that and arrested you for murder, which you then confessed to. You did a shit job. You're a rubbish criminal. I mean, he didn't do a good job trying to get away with the crime, but the crime itself was spectacular. It was? It was? How? Alfredo boasted about his ability to dismember Hazes' body with such skill that his scalpel never once touched a bone. 
Okay, and the tiny box he was able to fit the entire body into. I mean, how could the police not be impressed? Despite a speedy arrest and full confession, Alfredo wouldn't be sentenced until May of 1961, about 18 months later. Where he was during that period of time isn't entirely clear, but it surprisingly seems that he wasn't in a jail cell as he took a wife in between his arrest and his sentencing. Who are you? How are you doing this? What's wrong with your brain? They say I'm charming. This was the first of two women that he would marry. Some people use this as proof that Jesus had not been his boyfriend, which it definitely isn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 he's married to a woman. He could have possibly be gay or ever have been gay or... <laughs> the past the as for charges or bisexual i should say not gay because you know or i mean then he could just have because it's the past he could just have a wife to like so he doesn't so people don't think he's gay it's the past as for the charges against alfredo he had been accused of clandestine burial use use usurpation usurpation you could be usurped so the pronunciation would be usurpation that's a brand new word to me of the profession and qualified homicide <laughs> qualified he did such a good job qualified surgical homicide when i first read that i assumed qualified her homicide was some sort of lesser form of murder than that involved mitigating circumstances or something no i think it might mean more intense murder a mistake i keep making whenever i see some sort of adjective in front of homicide under mexican law qualified homicide is the intentional killing of a person over whom the killer had an advantage advantage in this context is pretty broad and include things like having a weapon lulling someone into a false sense of security before stabbing them in the back manipulating them through some sort of imbalance in power such as a teacher student dynamic that these two had and it even includes just being physically stronger than the victim um okay i get the feeling that's one of those like aggravating factors that means the difference between you know a lighter sentence and a heavier sentence or a heavier sentence and death by charging him for with qualified homicide alfredo was eligible for the death penalty bingo he became the last person to be condemned to death under mexican law even though a ban on capital punishment wasn't actually instated for more than four decades following this sentence once he was in prison alfredo quickly gained a positive reputation the police may not have been impressed with the skill that he dismembered his former colleague and possibly lover but the other violent criminals at topo chico certainly were the fact that he offered free medical services to the other inmates up to and including minor surgeries certainly helped as well yeah i mean there's no reason to ignore this he's a qualified doctor he might have murdered somebody he's in prison he's probably not going to be murdering anyone you'd, you'd just be like yeah let's use him if i was like running the prison i'd be like okay let's use the psycho doctor he can like provide some advice we'll you know keep a really close eye on him <laughs> not let him use the scalpel in his free time <laughs> and why not why not there were a few developments while alfredo was in prison the first was that he begun to use the name dr salazar i can't find any backstory on where this came from nor whether he adopted the nickname himself or was given it by his fellow inmates my best guess based on what i've read is that the name was likely given to him as homage to emiliano zapata salazar a mexican revolutionary from the early 1900s how is he a revolutionary he's just a rich guy who murdered somebody and got caught immediately <laughs> how revolutionary salazar became a bit of a folk hero and he was a champion of the impoverished working class who were being increasingly repressed repressed by wealthy landowners similarly alfredo was well loved and respected by the poorer citizens of the area he was well known for providing his medical services to the poor and elderly free of charge something that begun before he was in prison and continued until he stopped practicing medicine it's just my speculation but i figured that the name had to come from somewhere the next big development was all those dead bodies they found technically they found the bodies before alfredo was in jail but they wanted to connect him to the murders a series of victims had been found alongside the side of state highways and the murders are described as being similar in nature to the murder of jesus but with no explanation of how it was speculated that he had preyed on hitchhikers and other lone travelers people he thought that nobody would miss ah, okay so he's been doing this for a while but then you kill someone did you want to get caught like if you've been successfully killing people and getting away with it and then you kill your lover slash person who owes you money slash colleague in your office and then you sloppily go and bury them on a ranch with two witnesses the aunt and his other lover allegedly then you don't bother returning the spade and you do such a shit job that they literally find the box of bone the box of body the next day were you trying to get caught this feels like a completely different criminal of course no connection between alfredo and these murders was ever made if i had already been accustomed to tossing bodies on the side of the road i, I can't imagine i'd have bodied buried hazes's body somewhere that it would be so easily found and traced back to him and unless these bodies were dismembered and packed into surprisingly small boxes it doesn't sound like his mo i'm just going to assume they were not disposed of in such a manner otherwise it would be pretty easy to connect alfredo to them yeah this just seems like completely different crimes 
After all, he had gleefully bragged about being able to dismember the bodies without ever touching a bone with his blade, his handiwork would have been pretty identifiable. It's a good thing for Alfredo that despite the accusations, no evidence would ever tie him to these murders. Why were they even considering tying him to these murders? They seemed to just be unsolved murders from another killer. One, because he probably had nothing to do with them, and two, because further convictions would likely have prevented the final big development in Alfredo's prison story. His lawyers got his death sentence commuted. In 1980, after serving 20 years in prison, Alfredo was released. <laughs> he surgically cut up a body in the bathtub. Bro. Okay, 20. I don't know. I don't know. Like, what's the right sentence of that? It's just a one off murder. He'd be like, well, you'll get one for free. I mean, not for free, but for like 20 years in prison rather than prison forever or death. That does seem a little bit. I don't know. If I was that dude's family and I'd just been like sliced up, I'd be like, why are we letting you out of prison again? <laughs> Can't he just die in prison? Doing his like free doctory stuff and being a weirdo? Uh, he then went back to practicing medicine. Not that he ever really stopped. Except this time, instead of doing it in prison, he was back in his old office treating patients in the same room where he had killed his former friend and possible lover. Uh, which isn't at all creepy. <laughs> They had his office after 20 years. Viva Mexico! Alfredo's first wife had passed away while he was in prison, so when he was released, he wound up marrying another woman. The couple had multiple children together, though she died just five years after he got out of prison. He lived a quiet life after this, offering free medical care to the poor and elderly, as he had always done. In December of 2008, he agreed to an interview with the Monterey newspaper, although he was happy to discuss what his time in prison was like. He refused to discuss the murder. He was also now practicing medicine from the confines of a wheelchair after having suffered a spinal injury. By this point, Alfredo said he couldn't even remember how long he had been a doctor, but it was over 50 years. He intended to continue helping people and hoped to regain his ability to walk again. In the interview, he also discussed some of the difficulties he had faced since prison, not from the community, but from his own depression. Though things had improved, he admitted to still being overwhelmed by the unbearable weight of what he had done. As he stated toward the end of the interview, I paid what I had to pay. Now I'm just waiting for the divine punishment. Divine punishment. He wouldn't have to wait long for that divine punishment, as just a few short months after the interview, Alfredo died of prostate cancer at the age of 77. Because he died in 2009, before Thomas Harris tried to uncover the identity of the mysterious Dr. Salazar that he had once met, it's normally reported that Alfredo died without ever knowing he was the inspiration for Hannibal Lecter. However, this is not actually the case. This is, it's quite different from Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> it's not, I guess it's just the inspiration, right? According to the family friends, when Alfredo first heard the reporter who had interviewed him all those years ago had written a book, he didn't really pay any mind to it. But when the movie Silence of the Lambs came out, he and his family immediately recognized that Hannibal was inspired by him. <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine just going to that movie and being like, Oh look! That's me! <laughs> I'm the inspiration for that! Yes, I'm famous! It's Hannibal fucking Lecter! Throw me with your acumen. Jesus. That'd be a good time. His family began to tease him, calling him Hannibal and Dr. Lecter, which he took great amusement in. Wrap up. Despite being the inspiration for the character and personality of Hannibal Lecter, Alfredo Borley Trevino doesn't really seem like the sort of cold, murderous psychopath that Lecter was. In fact, while it feels really weird for me to say this, given my thoroughly documented pro-murder stance, I think it's actually good that he didn't receive the death penalty. Yeah, me too. I don't think this guy deserves the death penalty. He killed one person, um, and uh, the aggravating factor of him being like his teacher, I don't think that's enough to like get it escalated to the death penalty. Death penalty, I'm always like, yeah, murder children, murder lots of people, be like particularly sadistic in some way. Like there needs to be some major aggravating factor for me to be like, cool, death penalty. This I feel like was fairly just, just punishment, to be honest. Well done, Mexico. Though his crime was absolutely horrific, and his pride in the quality of his craftsmanship seemed to imply a serious level of psychopathy, it was an isolated incident and quite likely a crime of passion. He spent his 20-year sentence using his medical expertise to help people, and once he was released from prison, he continued to do the same. And most importantly, he seemed to genuinely feel crushing and inescapable guilt over what he had done. Which doesn't tie in with the fact, I think him like bragging about the dis the, 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 like how precisely he just dismantled the body and stuff was probably like some post-murder psychosis going on in his mind. Because that doesn't, he doesn't seem like a psychopath. He just seems... That seems like a, a crazy psycho thing to say, but I think that's probably because he was just like, not PTSD'd or whatever, but like, you know, he was in some sort of post-shock after killing someone, because it all happened very quickly. 
Obviously, the best case scenario would be for him to have not murdered Jesus, but he was able to bring some good to the world following his crime that would never have happened if he had received the sort of swift execution I usually root for. It's easy to fear that someone who is released from prison will just become a repeat offender. Even if the person wasn't already fundamentally broken in some way that incarceration alone wouldn't fix, prison could cause people to lose their identity, their sanity, their humanity. But Alfredo remained true to who he was. He was a brilliant, curious doctor that provided free care to those who needed it most. The only things he seemed to lose in prison oh, were pride in his murderous act and his Rolex watch. You see, when Alfredo wasn't wearing his watch, he kept it stashed in a sock along with a wad of cash. You might think that somebody discovered this and stole it, but he actually just threw the sock away by accident. But if that's the worst thing that happened to him during 20 years in prison, I'd say he made out pretty well. Yeah, agreed. This was, uh... <laughs> It's rare that I'm like, yeah, okay. And everybody got what they deserved, except for Jesus, who was murdered, of course. Um, but, you know, the criminals. Thank you for watching. This has been an episode of the Casual Criminalist. If you're listening to this uh, as a podcast, please do consider leaving a review. That helps this show get in front of more people, and I greatly appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. 